right, and we are back, finally, with another exciting episode of Giant Reviews, which I haven't done an episode in quite a while, because I haven't found the time between writing my book, now editing, doing other podcast stuff, co-hosting Digital Archipelago, co-hosting The Computer Room, to do Giant Reviews, but I definitely am going to bring it back, because I've discovered a new pipeline of grifting. Which is someone paying me $100, PayPal, in my link tree, and uh, I believe PayPal is also in the description below. Pay me $100 to review a film. Now, if you want me to review a film, I certainly will gladly oblige. It has to be a real film. It can't be, you know, it can't be corn, if you know what I mean. It has to be a reasonable length, and it, it can't be... Uh, well, I don't know, I'm pretty open to documentaries as well. As long as it's not, like, explicit corn. As long as it has some riveting content. And it has to be a real film. And I guess, like, even lengthwise, if it's too long, I probably will just skip around. I mean, a, a series would obviously cost you a lot. Well, well, not a lot more, but, like, you know, a series. Or uh, it has to be the reasonable length. Or even a book. Like, right now, I... I I'm reading a book, which I believe is a Amish love story by Beverly Lewis. Um, I believe my friend, uh, our friend of the Digital Archipelago, John Carter, he uh, paid me some, some money for that one. But yes, I am reviewing a film that, when I saw those Super Chats, I never thought I was going to like. I thought this was going to be absolutely hell. And this is going to be not good. And I'm going to suffer for two or three or however many hours. But, shocker, I actually found these two films quite good. The first one better. But this is the giant art reviews of Legally Blonde and Legally Blonde 2. It's finally here. This has been a meme that's going on. For a while in the digital archipelago circle or well, i mean community is kind of played out the digital archipelago community and uh, <laughs> oh boy i can't believe i'm doing this i can't believe i'm doing this but i actually did find it quite good because as a terminally nostalgic millennial i found the films quite good so yes i'm bringing back gender reviews i have a number of other films i have to review i'm going to review the film, the French animation film, which actually is a quality, high IQ, and incredibly done artwork uh, animation film from France in the 70s called Fantastic Planet. So I'm going to do Fantastic Planet. And then I have to do... Oh, God. That's going to be really painful. But I might have to paywall it. I might have to paywall it because it's a bit too spicy. And I believe YouTube censors certain discourses around the film. That, or, well, the discourses that the film deals with. It's called Envy Desire. It's produced by uh, it's a lot of these Dime Square figures. Uh, Pariah the Doll, most notably. And I, I really have no hate towards them. I actually did quite enjoy it. I think that the film suffered from certain... A film that's trying to be terminally online, I think, would have been better if it wasn't as terminally online. But anyways, I, I do think it's a quality film, and I have no hate towards, you know, I'm I'm pretty, uh, I think, uh, you know, I think the Dime Square people, for certain criticisms I have of them, I do find a lot of their work kind of fascinating. I am, you know, I do listen to the occasional Red Scare episode. I'm enough of a man to admit that, and I believe I am mutuals with Anna Kachayan. And if Anna and Dasha want to come on Content Minded... I don't know. I don't think Prude would. Want, I don't think Prude would approve uh, them coming on Digital Archipelago. But I think if they wanted to come on Content Minded, I would be totally open to that. But I, I did think it was a good film. I, I think that for a a very very incredibly low budget indie film, a uh, short film, it was pretty. It was pretty decent. And I will break it down. I may be breaking it down with Matthew Gustav, So we'll see what happens. But this is the review of Legally Blonde. So again, PayPal in the bio, in, in the description. But also, uh, if you want to DM me the film that you're thinking of wanting me to review. I mean, what's what's $100 in this day and age, right? It's not much. And I'm a leaf. And certainly, it has to be American USD because... Uh, 
Anyways, I've grifted so hard. I'm very sorry. I, I feel dirty that I'm grifting at this level. But I wanted to do a serious review of Legally Blonde. And I have a bunch of notes. And I have uh, some review articles that came out. Some I, I believe this one is 20 years after the film was released. And I wanted to treat the topic seriously. Because when I remember when it came out at the time. And I remember my, my mother watching it. And then watching the second one. I was like, oh, this is just a chick flick. This is stupid. This is ridiculous. This is like preppy girl stuff. And this is something that it's sort of like Mean Girls. I remember. Maybe if someone wants to pay me $100 to review Mean Girls, I definitely will do it. Maybe I'll bring my friend Danny on. He, he also loves Mean Girls. I remember when I was a kid. By kid, I mean like mid like elementary school. I think it was like grade eight or something. I mean, no, it was before that. It was either grade six or seven. And I remember uh, there was movie day. It was a Friday, end of the month type of thing. But my teacher at the time wanted us to have a movie that was educational, quote unquote. And the girls immediately wanted us to watch Mean Girls. And I'm like, oh my God, this is terrible. And all the guys in the class are like groaning. And they're like, oh no, can we watch some other like, dude movie, because everyone at the time, I remember, well, even before that, like, in grade four, everyone was talking about Napoleon Dynamite. I hated that. I hate that film to this day, because for, like, a few years straight, because you have to remember, the culture was not, like, the internet culture, the online-centric culture we have now, where I'm assuming, again, I'm assuming that Zoomers are in high school or in high school or even early college now, that the meme lingo goes as fast as the internet. But back in the day, if you had like meme lingo, it lasted forever. People were debating uh, Xbox 360 versus PS3 forever for like year or years. People were quoting Napoleon Dynamite for like years and I hated it. I would just like hear a random Napoleon Dynamite quote and it just totally soured me to the whole thing. Anyways, if you want to pay me $100 to review Napoleon Dynamite, there you go. Oh, God, why did I even put that idea out? Now someone's going to do it. I'm going to have to suffer all over again. But anyways, I was watching Mean Girls, and I remember I didn't pay attention to it. I was like, oh, okay, this is a girl's film. But, you know, when you're a kid and you're a boy, it's like you, you have a very narrow view of things. But a few years ago, more than a few years ago, I remember it was on TV and my mother was flicking through the TV and it came up on one of these movie channels and I actually sat down and watched it. And it, it blew my mind because it actually had a lot of meaning. Maybe just, again, the millennial nostalgia goggles that were put on me. But it actually was a meaningful film. And I'm like, this is the millennial film, right? Like, it, regardless of gender or anything. And I think Legally Blonde is similar in that, okay, so let me get my initial thoughts out of the way before I, I'm not going to, because if you're familiar with my work, I'm not doing like a video essay breaking down uh, a film in terms of scene by scene, but rather the overarching themes I feel are more meaningful than if I were doing like a highly edited vis video essay on Legally Blonde, which I'm sure they exist. Actually, let me do a YouTube search right now. I think there's like one or two. I'm actually surprised that you don't have like these uh, left-coded women video essayist types. Like, uh, so, what's her name? Olivia Sun Vi. She actually does some good work. I, I shouldn't slant her that much. But uh, you have like Strange Aeon. Oh, God. You have like uh, Froggy. What's her name? Fishy Froggy. Froggy Friend. I don't know. Faye, Froggy, Friend, something like that. You have that Campbell girl who called uh, Joseph Campbell an Austrian painter, fan. God, maybe I should rip that apart. I should rip that apart one day. But again, the reaction videos are sort of ugh. But anyways, I wanted to get into uh, a serious discussion of the overarching themes. And again, as a millennial, I think that it serves... Um, it serves to give you a picture of the cultural milieu at the time that Legally Blonde came out. Both films, by the way. And I think that there is a difference between the two films, not just in terms of plot, but also in terms of the dramatic, 
not dramatic, but you can start to see the differences creeping in in terms of the culture between 2001 and 2003, which is pretty evident. But let me just say that my impression to begin with is that not only is it a time capsule, but it serves as a good reflection of the periodization and the categorization of different cultures that Gen Xers and Millennials were acquainted with and that youth culture in general was slotted into. And it was groundbreaking in that there was this moment, and people were saying this in different commentaries on Legally Blonde, that there was a moment in the mid, I would say early to mid 90s, up into the early 2000s, where women that were more intelligent, there, there was like the Daria character, where women were seen as more tomboyish, and that they were celebrated for their intelligence. There was like Riot Girl punk. No, Kathleen Hanna. There were, yeah, of course, Daria. There was, you know, Ginny Garofalo. Like, I'm talking this type of culture. That you were an alternative girl, that you had a form of actual appeal. Again, I'm censoring for YouTube. You had a form of actual appeal, but you didn't have the overt manifestations of quote unquote preppy girls. And when my generation came about, there was the, certainly the dichotomy between like emos and preppy people and preppy girls. But then, of course, by the time we get to the mid 2000s, those subcultures had blended. And there was like, you know, preppy scene girls. And there was, uh, you know, there was a lot of emphasis even around the aesthetic and the music of the time that I don't think still exists the same degree among the youth of today. And a lot of that has to do with the internet age. And so Elle Wood and Legally Blonde as a film is basically revenge of the pretty hot blonde girl, the preppy girl. That's the whole point, is that now they can also achieve intellectually, academically. They can also have a life. And by the way, one thing that I was shocked at, not really, because again, this film was made in 2001, is there really was sort of a more, maybe if you were, say, a feminist or, or whatnot, you would say it's not that healthy, but there was a healthier approach to when you go to college, you want to find a partner, you want to get married. And there is, of course, and I am going to talk about it, there's a lot of class distinctions that also break up into the aesthetic and the region of different peoples at this time. So he, she's dating like the last remnant of a wasp, blue blood, who has to be expected to excel academically. And of course, he can't marry like a bimbo. He can't marry a preppy, uh, where was she from, Miami? Uh, a beauty school graduate who, you know, and there was this one part that, her father said when she's like, I'm going to go to Harvard Law because I want to win him back. <laughs> Her father said, uh, you know, lawyers are stuffy and boring and ugly and you're neither of those, th those things, honey. And so it really shows the dichotomy between the regional distinctions in America, the class distinctions, but importantly, how it fuels the aesthetic distinctions between people. Because then when she goes to Harvard She's like all in pink and she's blonde and no, there's no other blondes. And of course, another thing too, before I forget, is at the end of the film, you know, spoiler alerts, there's going to be tons of spoiler alerts. When she graduates, there are blonde women students in the crowd when she's graduating. So that's sort of like in that short amount of time, there is a turning over of the image, the aesthetic image of that type of woman who is like, for example, Elle Wood, She's the head of her sorority. They worship her at the sorority. They do her bidding because she's the best and she's going to have this dream wedding that then falls to pieces because, of course, her man can't marry someone who's not as educated, who doesn't come from the same academic stock. And, and the premise of the film, which was really transgressive at the time, was that Elwood is not like a stupid like a stereotypical blonde at that time. By the way, those stereotypes, I don't really think they still exist to the same degree. Because I think that there was a, a conscious exilization 
of a lot of women that don't fit the bill of that prawn star blonde look or like the ditzy trophy wife blonde that stuff doesn't really exist anymore now you have a, a wider view i mean which in a way is kind of worse in a way that you have a, like a wider like everyone's constantly gooning all the time to different images of women irregardless of their shape or whatever and the sort of like pro uh pro x positive inclusiveness in that which a lot of like older rad femmes are correct about this that's actually worse because now you know all women can become objects of lust and gooning and so forth but what happened was it really broke that stereotype it was revenge of the hot girl revenge of the blonde girl where they can prove themselves because literally she just reads textbooks and she uses her natural intelligence to then excel in law school to the point where she becomes an understudy a very powerful academic lawyer during this case where she's defending again another fellow blonde uh, proto influencer fitness woman by the way you've probably seen legally blonde by now i'm not gonna do the whole i i gave a spoiler alert but you know i'm gonna spoil the film but it was really interesting how her natural ability was still there and yes there was some struggling but as soon as she brushed up on a few legal concepts there was really no barrier she actually becomes quite a brilliant lawyer or or lawyer in the making in the second film she becomes a lawyer which i will talk about legally blonde too but there was a, a a pervasive sense that the aesthetic the music you listen to where you're from feeds into the class distinction between someone like al wood and someone like the women that she was oh what was her name the the uh the other girl that hated her at first that hooks up with her old boyfriend but then they they grow into being friends a uh, vivian vivian you know so she's like a typical massachusetts or new england blue blood woman she's the you know uh you know waspy highly intelligent daria like alternative girl with a snapping criticism and wit and she wants to really excel and you know she's sort of uh there, there's that one funny moment where isn't that woman the the woman uh jennifer Coolidge? didn't she play like stifler's mom <laughs> There's a woman point where uh, Elle finds a beauty parlor because, of course, the beauty parlor becomes the symbol of free-reigned female camaraderie where they can be themselves and they don't have the same... They're not subject to the, the male gaze, put it that way, right? As problematic as that concept is, they're not subject to the male gaze, can be more honest. So Paulette, who is the beautician, she relates to her and there's that woman where she's like, well, is this girl uglier? And Elwood goes, hmm, it's unfortunate that she's not entirely hideous compared to me. And it's, <laughs> so, like, you know, beauty becomes a form of social currency. But in a way, legally blonde, and this is, I guess, would be more of a trad or right-wing criticism, is that it, gived, it, it gave, not give, it gave women a picture that they can have it all. That you can be pretty, you can be uh, a trophy wife, but you can also be intelligent, you can also excel academically. You can want a family one day. But I don't think that's really a negative picture because this film was a lot, in a lot of ways, was more innocent than later manifestations of this type of premise that came after it. And because there was a, and again, I'm saying this as a terminally online netocrat that's living in the 2020s, where everything is cynical, everything's a spectacle, everything's online. But I will say that looking back, those cultural expressions, especially when it comes to youth subcultures, was much more innocent than what we have nowadays. And so there was this pervasive discrimination against a pretty sort of blonde girl, a preppy girl. And it really revealed it. I think it wrote in my notes. I wrote in my notes. So she's going to Harvard. She gets accepted because now, of course, which is really funny how the pretty blonde girl is a symbol of diversity among the Harvard uh, elite. They're like, well, I guess she's she has a good record. She has an impeccable. She has a, a PhD in fashion and beauty and aesthetics. 
And it's, you know, it's really, uh, it's, I guess we need some diversity. And the diversity is, of course, a white blonde woman, which I thought was really funny and cute. But I wrote how, where's my notes here? When she goes to university, she discovers that the alternative girls, the smarter women, women of a sort of blue blood stock who are more academic, that they that dress very drab and dire, uh, they too have this biting, catty, Machiavellian character. That they reject a pretty girl, and that basically they are still caught within despite and, and this is what was the there was a lot of red pilling moments of legally blonde but the first red pill that i will get into is that they have this uh you know like what do they call it i think here in canada they call it frosh week in america they still call it frosh week i didn't i never went to one i should have went to one but anyways i was more focused on my studies i was more focused on actually reading but people on the the sort of the first day it's like a tutorial and you're socializing with people. And there was this moment where they're on the lawn, right? It's typical like 90s, 2000s university, like hipster experience where you're on the lawn of Harvard University and you're introducing each other. And the one guy who is a bit, um, the, the tall guy who's neurodivergent and he's stuttering, he's like, hi, I volunteered in Africa to give uh you know inoculations to people and there was of course some kind of like toilet humor joke along with it uh this other girl's like I, I did this and that i'm a young youth achiever at the un and they were going through this litany of like college kid educated like liberal causes that impress people and they they impress low iq normies because they're really compassionate and they want to save the world and i've i've met so many of these types in university and of course Elle Wood is like going on about her fashion choices and the latest fall seasonal <laughs> you know seasonal attire and so forth and it was very funny but what happened was later in the film despite all of their liberal highfalutin high intelligent perfect stock they want to save the world they're perfect humanitarians despite all of their intentions they're just as evil and exclusionary and Machiavellian social strivers as college kids in, in law school as anyone else. And that was like a brilliant, brilliant moment because she was being excluded in the study group from her, her uh, ex-boyfriend, her, her ex-fiance was like, maybe we can like, you know, give her a break. But they're all like, no, we don't like her. Right? And then of course the whole, I know it's a, I know it's a fantasy. That at the end they then accept her and they love her and she becomes the or she wins the court case and of course the lawyer professor only tries to promote her be she he does some serious casting couch actual advances against her right and she flatly rejects it she says no i want to strive and i want to achieve being a lawyer and having a law firm off of my merit not because i am this erotic symbol and so there's a lot of healthy lessons i feel in legally blonde there's a lot of healthy red pill moments another red pill and <laughs> oh boy this is gonna get me into trouble another red pill moment was when that same uh neurodivergent tall guy he asks this woman out on the street and she's like i'm not gonna go out with you you're kind of a creep and then Elwood, and he goes along with it. He he realizes it was a bit. So Elwood turns around Reese Witherspoon. By the way, this is one of the best Reese Witherspoon acting gigs ever. Like, they really defined her career. Reese Witherspoon, sorry, Elwood turns around and she's like, I can't believe you stood me up. You broke up with me. You were such a great lover. And, and you were such an intelligent guy. And you swept me off my feet. But then you just dumped me. And I can't believe it. You have, and now you're courting another woman. And, and she storms off. And then that woman immediately was impressed. And she's like, well, when are you going to take me out on a date? <laughs> it's, that was great because it really highlights intra-female actual competition. That if you are a guy who is seen as someone who is worthy of desire from a pretty blonde woman, that you are an object of desire and an object of obsession by a pretty blonde woman then you are going to go far in the 
you know, your SMV is going to get stats boosted way up. And of course, that's like, uh, that's like, you know, typical Chateau here, T, Spandrel, uh, you know, F. Roger Devlin type of talking point that was led into a film made by Hollywood. So there you go. That That is really 2001 culture right there. That I thought was, that was a good red pill. So let me go through my notes because then we have to cover Legally Blonde too. But I did find that it was an intelligent subversion of a lot of tropes at that time. So you have like the 90s subculture. Of course, it opens up with the song Perfect Day. It's really sort of the, um, it's the perfect synthesis I wrote between the sort of pretty blonde trophy wife, the preppy girl, then becoming a girl boss or a proto version of the girl boss. And that a woman can really have it all. She can have looks, she can have intelligence, but it doesn't really, unlike a lot of other films, especially nowadays with Mary Sue characters, it doesn't really come off as, I mean, of course the film in general, I mean, though every film is sort of ridiculous and, and bends reality in a lot of different ways. There's a lot of moments in this film that of course bend reality, but it doesn't come off as that pernicious compared to other Mary Sue characters because Elwood still has to strive and work and achieve her position. And the fact that in the court case with that uh, fitness influencer that they alleged redacted her husband, and then it was revealed that it was the, the daughter. And again, she solves the case through her knowledge of fashion and hair and makeup. I'm not gonna spoil it totally, but it's a great scene. The court scene's a brilliant scene. Elwood still had to work for those accomplishments she wasn't handed everything, but also she realized as a preppy girl that comes from a background where she was going to be a beauty pageant contestant, all of her sorority sisters loved her, she was sort of handed everything, the, the, the Giga Chad, intelligent, blue blood, wasp boyfriend, she then breaks from that, like a typical hero's journey, a heroine's journey, and she realized that she actually had to work to accomplish things in life, which is in stark, stark contrast to every single Mary Sue character of the last 10 years. It really is, whether it's, um, you know, like that Ray girl in Star Wars, or, I mean, I know people were saying this about the, and again, I'm not familiar, I didn't see the film, I haven't read the books about the, uh, the Dune character, uh, Zendaya's character, they, you know, uh, I don't think she's really Mary Sue, but there's many examples of the Mary Sue. And, but what's, but what's funny though, is that when you have, this is a point about the aesthetics of it before I move on to my notes. And this is something I think is important when it comes to the greater culture of the early two thousands, or I should say the mid nineties before that, the early two thousands and then the mid two thousands. Okay. The early 2000s, I mean, of course you had the emo thing later on, but before that you had like a lot of the Daria type of like intelligent all girl women who were the girl next door, but they were also smart. They were sort of, they were goth chicks. There was emo girls after that, but you had that one slice in time to where, you know, pretty blonde, fashionista type of women could be celebrated, could be known for their attributes that aren't just reliant on looks or actualization and so forth. But then right after that, what do you have? Well, I mean, even I believe Emile came out in what, two, 1999, 2001. But right after that, you have the hipster girl, you have the manic pixie dream girl who also is an erotic symbol, but isn't like the preppy uh, blonde sort of woman you have like zoe de chanel you have 500 days of summer and that is a massive cultural shift because now you have and, and here's the thing what really makes you question things about legally blonde is that when you look at actual hollywood or even like not just hollywood but even literature even the small screen with television series when you look at the various productions of youth culture from the mid 90s all the way up until the 2010s a lot of people talk about how more attractive women have everything handed to them 
that they become, they go from like, uh, from being, you know, achievers and then they marry Giga Chad, you know, they, they, marry, they marry Brad's, right, who are, who are at the law firm and that they have everything handed to them. And in America, you have different subsections of this. You have like uh, the, there was this viral TikTok of these uh, pretty young girls dancing at some Southern university and all of those women, they're going to marry some, you know, some rancher or some guy with money, you know, they're going to go ahead. But when you really examine culture and youth culture productions, be it in film, television, or literature, even in the work of art, you have this sense of not that culture celebrates them, celebrates pretty women, but that there is this sense of like, we have to, we have to prop up the, the women who aren't conventionally attractive and that they are getting chided by Stacey's and that it's all about the women who are more intelligent, who don't look that good, but it's, you know, they're, they're the best. It's like, so you have this culture industry trope where in actuality, when you're actually examining youth culture media, the pretty girls, the, the blonde women, the, the erotically charged women, they're actually being denigrated by culture. They're, they're, maybe they're being celebrated in terms of everyday life for a variety of biological and cultural reasons that come together, right? But when it comes to actual media, it's always about how they're terrible, how they're mean girls, how they, they kick down all the other girls who aren't conventionally pretty, who, who find their you know, creative, artistic, or intellectual pursuits more stimulating. And those are the ones that they just, the, the Stacys, they coast through life. And a lot of people are, are saying that, well, that's just a male perception. But when you examine culture, especially films that are geared towards young girls, there, there's no incels there. I mean, maybe there is, but that's not geared towards incels or to the male gaze. It, it's to, towards other young girls. You know what I mean? You know what I'm trying to say here? That in actuality, when we examine the texture of media, when it comes to youth culture, especially youth culture geared towards young girls and young women, there's no celebration of pretty blondes anywhere. They're terrible, they're Machiavellian, they're mean girls, it, there's nothing. And what really, what Legally Blonde did is it broke that stereotype by saying that the pretty blonde girl, that she can also strive in an intellectual pursuit. And then after, and this was a, a, in terms of like, you know, female empowerment, all that stuff. What was really the most important thing. And of course, nowadays, modern, like woke uh, feminist academics, they would, of course, you know, the intersectional feminists, they would criticize this saying that, oh, it's just normative. They're all white. There's no diversity, oh, whatever, whatever, who cares? But in terms of an actual, like, real feminist narrative, if I'm going to put my, you know, male feminist cap... Oh, God, I can't believe I said that. But for argument's sake, let, let me put on my male feminist cap for a, mil, for a moment, uh, really quickly. The most important part, and again, spoiler alert, was at the end. When her boyfriend comes back to her and says, yeah, me and Vivian, you know, we broke up, and uh, I really miss you, Elle. And now that you're a high-powered you're going to be a high-powered lawyer. It's like, oh, can we get back together? And she says, you know what? No. Because I, she initially pursued Harvard Law to go fiancé chasing, but then she discovers her self-worth. She goes through the heroine's journey, and then she rejects the, the like, I, what am I, just, like, you know, sloppy seconds? I'm, like, uh, minced meat? It's like, now that she's proven herself worthy she says you know what i am worthy i am pretty and i'm also intelligent and so you know what i'm going to go with the actual nice older guy luke wilson sorry uh is it luke wilson no it's um yeah sorry it's luke wilson i got confused i thought it was owen wilson no owen wilson's his brother she goes with the nice guy who's also intelligent but who also sees the worth in her the way that her ex-fiancee does not. It's a very good story. If you listen, if you have a young girl 
If you, I, I know there's a lot of parents that actually listen to uh, this show and listen to Digital Archipelago. If you got a young girl and you want her to feel uh, like she can achieve things, she could also be pretty when she grows up and she can, you know, excel at academia while still having a sense of style. I think you should, you know, Legally Blonde is probably like the least offensive thing you could show her compared to a lot of other media out there that cater to young women that I think are culturally destructive. And, and I really I, I really thought that that was a positive message about Legally Blonde. It shows the foibles of the, the women that culture at that point was actually celebrating implicitly. And it shows that, you know, pretty women who have a sense of fashion, who are, you know, pretty pink pastel, who are girly girls, that they can also achieve on the backs of their own merit their own endeavor intellectually and that they don't have to sacrifice being girly girls to do it. And I think that's great. I think it's great, you know? And, uh, yeah. So this is what one article was it, what is it from? Uh, university of Chicago divinity school. This is, I think a, a, a great one that I found by Russell P Johnson. So let me skip to the bottom. It just explains about the, the story itself. Uh, Cosmopolitan magazine has been criticized for contributing to this com competitive dynamic among women, but the magazine Elle referred to as the Bible can also serve to create uh, liberative solidarity among embattled women, much like the real Bible. While Legally Blonde could simply exhibit female empowerment through a woman succeeding in a historically male-dominated legal field, it challenges viewers to consider where real empowerment comes from. Elle's flippancy about elite institutions, you got into Harvard Law, what, like it's hard? invites us to reevaluate whether true power drives from class status or from local sites of mutual encouragement. Again, she's not from a like high class wasp background, but yet she still excels and she does it because she wants it. She does it out of the back of her own, uh, her own will to overcome her present condition. Right? So that's a very positive message. The article then goes on to explain Legally Blonde differs from other films in a few other noteworthy respects. First, the hyper-feminine characters are not villainized. As U Chicago senior Sophie Marshall argues, movies are in the 90s and aughts. The 90s and aughts tended to depict young female protagonists as more tomboyish and not like the other girls. <laughs> from Daria to Zoe Deschanel. To, uh, to Barbie. There you, well, no, I guess Barbie... That's complicated because there is a through line between Legally Blonde and Barbie. But I guess from Daria... Even before Daria, do you remember... What was that? Oh, my mother used to watch that show. Was it the 70s or the 80s? Where it had, like, one of these, like, tomboy characters that was like the leader of the group she was like edgy and hard it was like a halfway house for these young girls they were like were they homeless what were they the facts of life that's what it was the facts of life it was from 79 to 1988 wow that was a good run uh my mother used to watch this show and it had like one of the tomboys and she was like the hard one what was her name joe Joe, that was, yeah, Joe was like the real, the archetype of the tomboy. And, uh, it may, oh, it was a spinoff of Different Strokes. Uh, that's interesting. Back in the day, uh, all these different shows are basically owned by the same network and had the same producers. So, for example, a lot of the, uh, like, sitcoms, that I guess were family oriented, but some of them weren't. And a lot of them did have the original like proto lib messaging was largely responsible or largely the creation of Norman Lear. So that's uh yeah, yeah, that's, that's uh anyways. So a through line from like Joe from the facts of life to Daria to Zoe D Chanel, I guess. And uh, I guess I what what is, what's that show that zoomers watch? What's it called? Euphoria? I get was that Zendaya's character in Euphoria? Where was she like the tomboy? What was she? I don't know. I don't care. I I I don't care that much to really uh look into it. Anyways, 
So there was this through line. So yeah, that's what the article said because it was sort of like, I'm not like the other girls. The foils, <laughs> I was going to say foil. The foils for these heroines are the pink-wearing, boy-obsessed, queen bee villains of the type seen in Mean Girls, 2004, and High School Musical, 2006. Filmmakers wanted to make their heroines, their heroines relatable for young viewers who feel like misfits in a social order designed to benefit others. And that really is something that is at the heart of certainly American culture. There's always this thing about the underdog, and it can be weaponized, of course, for like lib purposes. But there's always this thing about the the underdog against the striver, against the establishment, because of course the American spirit itself was a creation of rebellion and religious minorities being persecuted by a much older much well-established order and of course a frontier there's that theme of always opening up a frontier for others but then again there was a really uh, a deep spiritual sense to that but it's something within the american psyche that of course has been weaponized by hollywood to where the freaks and the losers and the misfits, not only are they lionized, but now they're celebrated. And really the MTV generation, even before us core Generation Y millennials, were the first, well, I mean the boomers really, the boomers are, there were, there were films in the early 60s that were very transgressive, that dealt with youth culture. There's a long history of this in the 70s and so forth. But in terms of like the the crystallization of that trope, I would say the mid 90s to the early 2000s had the plethora of now the outcast, the loser, the the nerd, right? Like I guess the Breakfast Club, right? Like that's was the the Generation X. But also you had American Beauty, you had uh what was the other example I was going to think of? American Beauty you had uh, the, the Teen Apocalypse trilogy. You had... Oh, God, it slipped my mind. Oh, Pleasantville. Pleasantville was the most vicious attack on normative, middle-class Americana there ever was. And people thought that Harmony Kareen was like that as well, but he was really... If you look at any Harmony Kareen film, there is a deep sympathy with those type of characters that is not present in productions like Pleasantville. But I digress. So uh, in a social order designed to benefit others. In the process though. They reinforce the notion that women who dress and act in girly ways. Are vapid manipulative or both. Michelle writes of the 2004 and 2008 Cinderella adaptations. A more tomboyish Cinderella. Represents the new era of redefining femininity. Which often leads to a complete rejection of hyper femininity. That women were subjected to back in the 1950s. And even the contemporary art world, you have uh, artists like um, Laurie Simmons, who is, I believe, married to Carol Dunham, mother of uh, Lena Dunham. And of course, Lena Dunham creates one of the uh, homage, one of the biggest homages to not like the other girls in the show girls. But anyways, it's funny. I think only like someone like Jack the Perfume Nationalist understands this. I, I personally have an utter loathing contempt for girls, but I do see... That if you um, if you were around at that time and you were watching it, I could see how there were certain things that you can interpret. Like the there's like you know there's like the dime square interpretation of girls, but I think that someone like Jack would understand that a lot of what went into girls came about from Lena Dunham's mother. Lena Dunham, uh, her mother is of course one of the most popular women contemporary artists there ever was. And she, yeah, Laurie Simmons. And Laurie Simmons, along with Barbara Kruger, Cindy Sherman, Marilyn Minter, really tried to pick apart that picture of 1950s domesticity and Americana in a lot of her artwork. And I think that that is something... But here's the thing. The transgression of Laurie Simmons was imparted onto the daughter... Because by the time you get to Lena Dunham's girl in, 20, in the 2010s, all of the transgression against that picture of the housewife and 1950s Leave it to Beaverism, all of that's gone and they're living in the ashes of the wake of 2010s feminism. 
and that so anyways that's a separate that's a digression but let's carry on a more tomboyish Cinderella represents the new era of redefining femininity, which often leads to a complete rejection of hyperfemininity that women were subject to back in the 50s. There is this new desire to display more stereotypically masculine traits in order to be taken seriously. In contrast to the villainization of hyperfemininity, legally blonde is a breath of fresh air. Quote, God bless Elle Woods, Michelle writes, for helping young women recognize that they don't have to judge others or themselves for enjoying feminine coded aesthetics and lifestyles. And it's funny because uh, Elle Woods is sort of in the, really the shark, the sh you know, the shark, uh, the shark pit, not the shark, I'm mixing metaphors. The shark tank, she's in the, the snake pit, and she's really trying to keep her good nature about her, you know, giving beauty tips to everyone, helping out even... Yeah, conventionally unattractive women and men and she really is sort of that picture of the hot girl can actually be nice now you know i was pretty much an ogre growing up and a lot of the hot girls in my school were nice to me maybe because i don't know i don't want to go i don't want to psychologize what that was maybe because i i don't know i listened to them or something some, something like that but does her success come too easily in her book neo-feminism cinema Neo-feminist cinema, girly films, chick flicks, and consumer culture. Film scholar Hilary Radner criticizes the plot of Legally Blonde, writing, Elle's virtue is easily acquired, demanding no sacrifices. Her happy ending is complete, a fantasy in which competing, desire, competing desires can be reconciled. I agree, though I see it as the strength of the film, to explain why we need to consider the gender dimension of the storytelling. Then uh, the article talks about Joseph Campbell's um, Hero of a Thousand Faces. Campbell-inspired cinematic story structure tends to presume the vision of morality in which the hero needs to, to have his sense of self, his attachment to ego, broken down before it can be rebuilt. The assumption that Elwood's character needs to make sacrifices in order to earn the happily ever after is thus standard filmmaking wisdom. But standard filmmaking wisdom reflects characteristically male experiences. Elle's journey, which has some character development but shares traits with the flat arc, the flat arc suggests an alternative way of thinking about the different paths people take towards uncovering their full humanity. Uh, fearlessly refusing to confront, conform to an institution when it is dehumanizing as a kind of heroism, uh, heroism that does not always follow the steps of a hero's journey. And it's a lesson that remains relevant in higher education and beyond, though saving her li later critiqued aspects of her own article, Legally Blonde's treatment of queer people leaves somewhat something to be desired well not in the 2003 one though we'll get to that both continue to inspire to this day staying up for women never goes out of style well i i wouldn't argue that i would say that she definitely did overcome a lot of limit not a lot of limitations but certainly some limitations but again it's like it is a wish fulfillment fantasy film and i think it's it's relatively wholesome given the current socio-cultural and political climate that we live in nowadays in the 2020s. It's a relatively easy, uh, easygoing endeavor. She certainly does face some hardships, but again, it's not really... There is a little bit of Mary Sueism, I will grant, because her intelligence and her ability and her will sort of does come naturally. Okay, so... Uh, but also, I, say, I would say that there is a sense of there is one type of white people in America, then there is the quote-unquote other white people I wrote in my notes. So what I mean by that is there she's the perception, and I think she even says this in the film, she's like, well, that means I'm just like white trash from Miami. I'm just like a pretty like trailer park beautiful that has a lot of money for whatever reason, and I didn't earn anything. And a lot of these older blue-blooded types who largely occupy academia, who have these like lib pretensions about the world, but yet when it comes to their own class distinctions, don't exactly follow through on them. There is that sense that, you know, you're from this one coast in America and you're like a totally different type of white person than I am. And, and, and I think you have to realize 2001 was before... A lot of the changing demographics in America 
And nowadays, when it comes to contemporary Hollywood, you simply can't have a story like this because of the demographic shift in America and because of the awareness of it and because you have to have this sort of like rootless cosmopolitan celebration of multiculturalism, blah, 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 blah. But I think that it really did highlight that even within predominantly groups of white people, there is largely a class distinction that comes with attribute, gravitas, uh, family upbringing, or rather family cultivation, and class distinctions. Largely intelligence as a social currency. Intelligence as both a social currency and an actual currency. And I think that Legally Blonde tried to break the mold to say that even if you were sort of like a sorority sister, you could, you could still achieve a level of success in that other world of the uh, quote-unquote other white people that look down upon you as a bumpkin, as someone who is basically like a trophy wife, not very intelligent, you know, uh, sorry, I, I said, I was saying I'm Miami the whole time. She's from Bel Air, so there you go. Even, you know, Bel Air, she's a valley girl, I guess you could say. So SoCal personality, even says in the Wikipedia. Uh, SoCal personality greats with the, what does it say here? Harvard Law School, uh, her SoCal, um, SoCal personality greats with the, um, contrasting to her disturbing distrusting east coast classmates of course there are a bunch of strivers and so forth so yeah i think overall it was a transgressive film in that sense that and it's funny because one of elwood's heroes is the law professor who is also blonde in a way and so it shows that you know even as a blonde woman you still can achieve a level of academic success and it's funny because that becomes the sort of the aesthetic signifier of a class signifier. And I think that was a very good distinction. Now let's move on to, maybe I should have a music break. Let's have a Philip Daniel music break, then I will get to Legally Blonde. and we are back i hope you enjoyed the music so legally blonde 2 i kind of uh i don't know i kind of didn't like it as much it still had some good points but a lot of her character was uh solidified and i think that legally blonde 2 red white and blonde there was also like a musical i believe uh, accompanying it she goes to Washington. She's a part, a high class lawyer. She's going to marry uh, Luke uh, Luke Wilson's character. But the reason she goes to Washington is because she's 
going to get married. She's going to get married on the uh, the starting plate at, at uh, Fenway Park, which is the home of the Boston Red Sox. It's one of the most famous baseball stadiums in the world. When when did Fen Fenway Park was uh, constructed? And wow, they broke ground in September 25th, 1911, completed in 1912. It's one of the famous like sports stadiums. It's sort of like uh, if you're a hockey fan, it's like uh, what's the the what's it called Boston Gardens? Is that the the original one for the uh, Boston Bruins? And of course, it's like the Maple Leaf Gardens or it's like the Forum. So yeah. Anyways, so they're gonna get married there, but then plans change because she's going to Washington. She's going from a law firm to becoming a politician, or rather, to become like uh, what do they call those? Like a uh, she works in some congressional committee. She's trying to be like a staffer. And the reason she's doing this is because before her wedding, she wants to find Bruiser's parents, which is her little, uh, what is it, Chihuahua dog? Yeah, Chihuahua. Wants to find Bruiser's mother to reunite them. But then she discovers that a cosmetic facility, a cosmetic testing facility, is using Bruiser's mother for cosmetic testing. And of course, she's mortified about this. And then you have the attachment to her, you know, her original PhD, which is in beauty and fashion. And she's trying to get through Bruiser's bill to end animal testing in America, then eventually to free Bruiser's mother. So I, I found it funny because it's sort of like um, only like, I guess it really is in some ways the fantasy of certain demographics of people where you're trying to like heroically change the world to fit your very like personal pursuit and there is something very funny to that it's something very funny but of course elwood she's trying to break the washington machine she's trying to drain the swamp and she you know elwood uh you know can you imagine donald trump maybe uh is Re oh, of I, I was going to ask, is Reese Witherspoon a lib? But, but of course, you know, every Hollywood actress is a lib, right? So, but it's it would be funny, though, if, say, Reese Witherspoon, I don't know, became, like, a, a MAGA Republican, and then she, like, came out with Donald Trump dressed as Elle Wood with the famous pink, you know, attire. And then, uh, so... Donald Trump's like my my political my political attorney, my understudy in the new administration uh, is going to be El Woods, ladies and gentlemen. And then, <laughs> but anyways, yeah. So El Woods is trying to drain the swamp, and of course she's has the sort of typical at this point fighting the system that is largely uh, instantiated in the older ways of Machiavellianism, distrust. And she's trying to use her, her amazing nature to change the, the Washington machine, to drain the swamp, to free the animals and all the good things. And you have a lot of, like, feel-good bipartisanship. But yet there is, like, a little sign here and there of social change. I'll get to that. But you do have the largely bipartisan, like, this is the machine of Washington, and I'm trying to actually do good. And the Washington political class is preventing me from doing so because it's all about underhanded deals. And even my great female politician mentor is backstabbing me and so forth. And and then uh, then she her petition's eventually successful. She marries Luke Wilson. Bruiser and his mother is reunited happily ever after. And it all hinged on her knowledge of makeup, cosmetics, fashion. And it really is sort of... Uh, it is, in some ways, it is kind of like a female power fantasy, but it's, you know, it's an innocent one. It's an innocent one. There's plenty of a lot of very terrible political shows and uh, political shows and movies that center around Washington and female girl boss politicians. I'm sure in the future there's going to be some kind of like made for TV movie around someone like Hillary, Hillary Clinton or whatever. And also while browsing uh, different things, apparently they want to produce a Legally Blonde 3 and Amazon is looking at a TV show. It was announced that Mindy Kaling is going to 
help write a new script for the film. So you, it's gonna be, it's gonna be atrocious. It's gonna be quote unquote woke. It's gonna be terrible. It's gonna basically crap over over the legacy of, like you know, that's what Hollywood does nowadays in the twenty twenties, right? Just miturates upon everything. It's going to be terrible, and it's going to uh, dash a lot of the feel good, somewhat bipartisan, somewhat apolitical nature of Al Wood. Although there is politics there, but it's remarkably apolitical for a political film because it is focusing on, again, another stereotypical girly girl thing of protecting animals and let's all let's all love each other and let's all break the system of mistrust and backroom deals. But another thing I observed with Legally Blonde 2 is that it's very funny because as much as Elle Wood wants to drain the swamp, you could say, I know I'm using this, uh, you know, somewhat facetiously or ironically, there still is the politics of secret societies and of fraternities or rather sororities that largely determine political outcomes in the Washington beast, in the quote-unquote swamp. So, for example, when Elwood discovers, she goes again, again, goes to a day spa, and she discovers that the politician that's sort of stonewalling her, uh, what's her name? I forget her name in the film. Is she part of the energy committee or something? She discovers that she is a sister, and that Elwood's is high up on the, uh, you know, the sorority that they're both a part of because she sees the ring that she has it's basically like it, it, it's almost like a clever spoofing of like you know you see a masonic ring or something like that then you do the handshake you know they're doing the uh they do the sorority sister greeting or whatever and it's it quite oh they released this on fourth of july oh my god that's crazy yeah so they uh you know they do the sorority thing but really, it shows that in in a weird way. It does show that <laughs> that in order to really get things done, that you're gonna have to uh, be a part of a secret society, nevertheless, which is quite funny. I found that to be a hilarious part of the film. Another thing about Legally Blonde too, before I get to my criticisms, would be that it really does show a lionization of the average people that work in and around Washington. For example, the doorman becomes integral to her political campaign because like there was a scene where she's like randomly trauma dumping on him. And then he sort of, uh, he empathizes with her. And then of course, because he's been at the, been a doorman at that important hotel in Washington for so many years, he really knows the ins and outs of the Washington machine. And he is sort of like, her political whisperer. And I think that was, uh, that was a very interesting thing that they were doing. And of course, you know, he's the, the sort of the, the sagely older white guy. And he, and it's funny. Cause I remember, uh, what was that show? I watched the Australian show, uh, rake rake. That was a great, <laughs> that was a funny show. He was a lawyer and he had this like, escort that his son wound up with and it was uh i think a lot of them they came from uh the show all saints a lot of the original actors but there there was um it, it said uh, he had a driver when he went into australian politics he, he uh and and he had a driver and basically there was a cabal of uh drivers that were <laughs> that that are servicing the political class that they're the real ones. They're the real secret society that controls everything. And there's like a, in, you know, intra, uh, there's like a turf war conflict between them. It's quite funny, quite funny show. But that was sort of like uh, the same theme that people that service people in power, that they're the real ones that control things. Or rather, they're the real ones that know things. And that was a good point. But then, of course, they still play up the typical Elwoods, like she's, you know, innocent and she's a babe in the woods and she really doesn't know or is prepared for the way that the Washington machine operates. And there's this one point where she's like, I'm, I'm going to change politics. I'm going to do it the Elwoods way. And of course, it would be as nice as possible and try to finagle a deal 
uh, perfectly whole and pure and so forth. But then, of course, uh, the the one staffer, the senior staffer, uh, what's her name? Grace, that's her name. Grace Rossiter, played by Regina King. She's like the, uh, you know, sassy African-American woman, but she's uh, deeply cynical and she's been there for a while. And she immediately sees that Elle is like this pretty blonde white woman who's being propped up to the, you know, to stardom. And it really, but then near the end, she sees the message that Elwood is preaching a, a message of uh, wholesomeness and goodness and so forth. And of course she helps, she helps Elle in the end. But I, I noticed that's one thing, even though there is some racial undertones, there wasn't that many besides the whole, like, you know, like the, you know, African-American woman always tired, hardworking, but also jaded and cynical at the, at the system. But I do notice there isn't a lot of overtly, uh, if it was me nowadays, and I, I think if they do make Legally Blonde 3, it's going to be like, uh, it's how shall I phrase it for YouTube? It's going to be uh, LGBT uh, by POC communism all the time. It's going to be a disaster. And there is, I, I think, from the left liberal perspective, or at least from a contemporary left left progressive liberal perspective, you could like criticize it and say that, well, they were ignoring the overt racial undertones of having like basically an all white cast with little sprinkling of diversity here and there. I believe Octavia Spencer is like a security guard. You know, uh, it's funny because I really, in my book, I really panned that Apple, uh, not Apple, that Microsoft commercial with Octavia Spencer, but she actually is a pretty decent actress. I got to say she's, she is a good actress. And that one film where she was like this, uh, trying to be like the cool woman, local woman that let all the teenagers basically squat at her her place. She was like this psycho. Oh, what was it called? Uh, I forget the exact, the exact. Uh, oh man, what was it called? It was a good movie. It was a good movie. She was pretty good in it. But any, anyways, uh, yeah. So there, there wasn't as many. Sorry, there wasn't as much overtly racial overtones as there would have been nowadays, but there was a lot of class overtones and the way that they treat a lot of the political issues does have sort of like a kitschy hokiness to them where it's like, we all, you know, why can't we just be nice to each other? But then of course you do start to see a lot of the, uh, not a lot, but you do start to see creeping in by the time you get to 2003. And then certainly after, by the time you get to the mid two thousands, you do have more of a politicization of things for example, the uh, both Bruiser and the uh, politician who's from Texas, uh, Congressman Stan Marks, he has like this, you know, manly Rottweiler. I'm a Republican. I'm a representative of the NRA. You know, and of course, both his him and uh, Elle's dogs are uh, they, they're of the LGBT variety when they go to the uh, doggy daycare. And they're like, well, you know, you're, you're like, your dogs are gay. And she, he's like, I'm fine with it. You know, it's all, it's all right. You know, I'm not hurting anybody. And that very much is sort of like the mid 2000s approach to the things that then later normal, normalized uh, LGBT marriage to, you know, make it as clean as possible for YouTube. That that was really the uh, the sort of like it doesn't bother you, it doesn't affect you, it's all right. Then there's, of course, the the dog protest where all of the, you know, everyone like uh, I think it's like a million man march, but it's a million person march. But with all the, the dogs coming in support of Bruiser's bill and, of course, uh, Congressman Marks is there with his uh, his dog. And it's uh, the, you know, the LGBT uh, dog rights people. And, you know, it's like, it, yeah, I mean, OK, you could see it starting you could see the propaganda slipping in, but I think that it, overtly, it didn't like really hit you in the face besides a very passive, like even a manly man from Texas can have a gay son, you know, <laughs> like a gay dog. So it was kind of, it was kind of goofy. And I understand that later on, especially after the mid two thousands, the propaganda machine of Hollywood, I mean, it was even present way before then, but it really ramped up after that. 
So, I mean, and of course it wasn't, you know, it became a sort of like normalized politics of acceptance or whatever. And that was the sort of mainstream liberal consensus of 2003. And of course, nowadays things are insane. So it's really, uh, I might get flack for even, you know, saying it in such uh, amicable terms or military terms. But yeah, it was it was a little part of it. It didn't it didn't spoil the film overall. Whereas again, I I I repeat myself. But if they were they are seriously going to make Legally Blonde three and with Mindy Kaling as a scriptwriter, that it's uh, it's over. It's over. But I digress. And of course, again, you have a you have a thing where Elle Woods is sticking up for like the you know less conventionally attractive nerd girls who are very awkward so like rena is another uh washington staffer and of course she's encouraging rena to try to pass the bill that she wants to uh that she's sort of she's overseeing and that she should be more forceful then of course she uh declares her love for the other the other guy that's working in the same office so she gains her confidence at the end very common trope of like the hot girl the hot girl is not the object of ridicule for being this cutthroat machiavellian bully but rather like the hot pretty girl is now the champion of all other women and it is a sort of like feel good positive message there from a you know from a woman's perspective and i you know there's there's certainly a lot of that where you do have very beautiful women who do have a certain form of kindness and social grace that will elevate other women around her. Now, some cynical people could say that, well, that's because when, you know, when attractive women surround themselves with less than attractive women, it's because it's a sort of like a actual female competition thing. But no, I do think that there are women that generally do have a form of social grace and they do want to see, you know, all women uh, worthy of other, you know, other things. And so, yeah, there you go. Like, uh, so Elwood is always being a matchmaker. She's always helping out the less than conventionally attractive women around her to realize their potential and so on and so forth. The way that she did with the cosmetician, uh, what's her, what's her name? Paulette go at her like scummy ex-boyfriend who took, took her dog from her. So, you know, and, and also like she was very awkward around the, uh, the attractive male UPS guy, mailman UPS guy. So, you know, there you go. It all, it all evens out. It's all like, let's face it. These, these films are female fantasies and I think you should treat them as such, but they do have sort of a very interesting take on things. And I was actually surprised at uh, how much I did enjoy watching them. I mean, there's some awkward moments here and there. I'm not a big fan of awkwardness humor where it's like someone's being socially awkward. It's not, you know, but anyways, one last point would be that there is a moment where Elwood was stabbed in the back by Sally Field's character, the uh, congresswoman for some kind of energy deal. And she's going to, the, of course, the Statue of Lincoln. As we know, American history began and ended with Abraham. Ended with, began, uh, sorry, not began. Well, maybe began and ended. Who knows? From I'm not going to get into that. But anyways, American history began with Abraham Lincoln. And he becomes the sort of kitschified symbol of Americana and democracy, irregardless of the actual history of Abraham Lincoln and the history of the American Republic, he sort of stands in for the near religious symbol of Americana that you can go to in Washington for, uh, for a sort of spiritual healing or support when you are trying to fight the Washington, the corrupt swamp Washington machine you know, so then Elwood makes her pilgrimage to Abraham Lincoln. And it is it is what it is. Of course, it's like that's what is the immediate symbol to most people. Because you have to realize a lot of these films, they have, uh, well, certainly, especially nowadays, you know, especially in the, the age of like the marvelization of every everything, really, from political discourse to artwork to everything. Everything has to be serialized. Everything has to be made quickly. And also, you have to keep in mind that to like non speak non English speaking non Western audiences that may pass around Hollywood films years after the fact, 
you know, like in places like China and so forth. So therefore, you know, a lot of things have to be cut and dry. But anyways, that, yeah, so uh, Washington becomes a e very easy symbol just to say, like, this is the heart of a pure version of Americana. And so that's why they had that scene. And then, of course, Elwoods gets married and Paulette is married and ha is expecting a child. And, of course, uh, El glances at the White House, winking at the camera, so sort of breaking the fourth wall. And, you know, maybe uh, Legally Blonde 3, I, I don't know, Elwoods becomes the first female president. But can you imagine if they did make it nowadays? I guess Elwoods would become, like, Hillary Clinton or something. And you'd have, like, I guess Alec Baldwin could come in and play, like, an evil Trumpian figure. Didn't Alec Baldwin play Trump in those SNL skits? Yeah, that would be... I, I can almost... I can write from, from a contemporary Hollywood lib perspective. I can write the script out. Elwoods becomes like Hillary Clinton, but it's like Hillary Clinton won against the evil Trumpian figure hemmed up by Alec Baldwin. And they can even give him like the blonde comb over hair. They could give him the Trump hair. And it's good. See, there you go. I could write this script uh, like blindfolded, literally. You know, I could write the script in my sleep, what they could possibly do. But anyways, that's an aside. So final thoughts, I did think that Legally Blonde and Legally Blonde 2, I, I did enjoy them more than I thought I would. And they really are a piece of early 2000s history. And they really are a foundational piece of media for a lot of millennials, a lot of millennial women. I would, maybe not in the same level as Mean Girls, but it really is sort of the good B side, or rather A side, uh, to Mean Girls as such. Because now the mean girl is no longer the mean girl. The mean girl is uplifting all other females, irregardless of age, looks, social status, or class. And she even empathizes with the, you know, the, the blue-blooded striver woman who stole her man from her. Then they become best friends, it says at the end. And I think, uh, I don't know, what did it say at the end of Legally Blonde, the first one? I guess her former fiancé just goes on to do like be become a lawyer and that's it or something. So yeah, everything works out at the end. Everything is a neat package. But Elle Woods bends reality to her SoCal Valley hot girl will. And that's the whole point. I mean, it, it is a female fantasy that she bends her will, especially around the corrupt Washington machine or the corrupt academic machine that has a lot of high-minded uh, principles or rather talks a lot about high-minded ideals, yet doesn't live up to them, still instantiates the same old class and, and uh, class biases and so forth. So here you have a character who, with her goodness and innocence, transgresses a lot of those older institutions. And, and again, you could say it is like a girl boss female power fantasy. Maybe Elwoods will have a, you know, have a full family in the next one, who knows. But it is, it becomes iconic. And of course, uh, did she, cap? yeah, she calls her outfit Capital Barbie. I, did they release a Barbie doll? Did, I think they did release a Barbie doll back in the day with the same outfit. Or there was some kind of collaboration or whatever. Barbie goes to Washington type of deal. And I think this film actually is uh, I, I, a lot more enjoyable. Speaking of Barbie, it was a lot more enjoyable than Barbie. I think it was, uh, you know, here's the difference. If you wanted an actual developed character. Because, yeah, like, I'm not going to get into it. Because me and Prude review Barbie and a lot of people. Like, Barbie, I think Red Scare podcast did say it the best. Barbie is a discourse machine. And it's like, what did Greta Gerwig mean by this? But I think that this is better because with Barbie, she yearns to be normal, quote unquote. And she... Uh, knocks herself from a place of exceptionalism to like worshiping the decrepitude of old age and and uh the sort of like very like retrograde well in the 2020s retrograde but very retrograde like 2010s feminism like that one america ferrera rant in the film about like women have to be this and they have to expect this and they have to expect that but why can't we be like this and blah 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 and it's very much like oh god you know you're groaning in in some ways but I think that this is 
this is like if you want to say that Barbie is a female power fantasy girl boss film, this is a way better and more innocent and more sincere version of a girl boss power fantasy film because Elle Woods goes from strength to strength. She okay, she faces a number of uh, points of adversity, but she goes from being exceptional when it comes to the world of fashion, beauty, good looks, the world of the preppy blonde girl to the world of the hard-nosed academic girl boss, high-powered lawyer that solves cases, that disrupts the Washington machine. She goes from strength to strength. I'm sorry. If I had to pick the two in terms of a more appealing character for young women, I, I pick Elle Woods over Margot Robbie's Barbie like, if I had a daughter, you know what I mean? I would definitely want her to be more like Elle Woods than, like, this, like, resentful, like, oh, my God, I'm so perfect and I hate it. Uh, but Margot Robbie's Barbie, you know? Like, really, she marries a nice man who's very kind and very understanding. You know, she tried to secure his dream wedding on, on the, uh, you know, the Boston Stadium there. But she's like, you know, he's like, you know what? I don't care as long as I'm with you. And we're getting married. That's all I care about. And of course, uh, Paulette gets her husband to mail them the the starting plate. The, the do they call it a starting plate? The baseball diamond, the the first baseball diamond. I'm not that familiar with baseball. I'm I'm a hockey fan, you know. But yeah, so it's like he she marries a good guy who's very kind, who isn't like an asshole like her other ex, and and then they have like this perfect life. To sorry, Fenway Park. They have this perfect life together. Like, that's a really, that's a great message right there. You know, whereas, like, with Lily Blonde, sorry, with uh, with Barbie, that's a Freudian slip. With Barbie, you have, like, this very sterile, very uh, cold detachment to Ken. And then Barbie's like, well, you, you know, I mean, you, you did your little revolution, but, you know, you should try, really try to find yourself. You know, I know that, I know that I was psychically tormenting you, and I know that your whole existence is to serve me, but, you know, you should really find yourself. That's your fault, bro. Like, I <laughs> Where is it legally blonde? As a very different... Now, it does show a lot of different sides of the male ego in Legally Blonde. That's the last thing I'll... Last point I'll make. Is that in Legally Blonde, unlike Barbie... Again, I'm just going to rant about Barbie, but anyways. Unlike Barbie where men are either subservient, groveling simps, or they're pigs that are they're monsters thirsting for power and to subjugate women, then they have to go into sort of like impotent, uh, reclusive, like semi-MGTOW exile after their, their failed revolution. Whereas in Legally Blonde, you do have men that are pigs, that are ignorant, that uh, treat women as merely X objects and, and that's it. But then you also have men who are uh, very fatherly and, and encouraging and, and a lot of men who are in positions of power that do do the right thing. And it, it really, it does. I don't really see any resentment, resentment towards men because Elwood's even helps like the lowly nerd who can't talk to women which nowadays, if you made the film nowadays, he would be depicted as like this weirdo incel that's like creeping on Elle Woods. Whereas she's, he's trying to, uh, he's trying to secure his beautiful mid for a date. Then Elle Woods helps him out. Then you also have the, the, the doorman who is a fatherly, saintly figure. Of course, Luke Wilson's character is a positive male figure. And of course, Congressman Marks helps her out and sees past his sort of, uh, which I guess is a transgressive thing, seeing past his... Republican, conservative, pro-gun, Second Amendment priors to, to help out the, the little animals and so forth. But it's a feel-good message. There isn't really a lot of ire directed at specific types of people because even the class issue becomes mediated. It's not that Elle Woods resents their class, their position, their blue-bloodedness in America. She rather just wants to change the system to accommodate the talents and skills of other people that don't fit that mold. And that very much is like a, a 2000s, like early 90s liberal message. Whereas nowadays, you would have a total class, gender, and racial warfare that would be never-ending. 
And uh, I think that this movie couldn't be made nowadays, both of them. So that's my review of Legally Blonde. And like I said, if you want to DM me with a review or do you want to PayPal me $100 for a movie review, it has to be a real movie. It can't be like corn. It's going to be with, I guess, in a reasonable length. Although I have watched films like Saint and Tango, even a longer film, as long as it's good, right? As long as it has some meat to it, right? Even short films. I, I mean, I'm reviewing a short film. But anyways, it, yeah, so my PayPal is in the bio. Of course, name the film you want. And I also have a right to reject or send your money back because if I feel the film is either too time-consuming or too... Uh, there's not enough meat there. Like, if you're giving... Like, I don't know, I don't know. Like, even if it's a kid's movie, I guess... Uh, my mother quite quite likes watching a lot of kids' films, the animation films. Like, for example, I'm reviewing an animation film right after this. I'm reviewing Fantastic Planet, which is a very amazing and meaningful animation film that came out in the, in the 70s. Sorry, no, I was going to say 60s. Came out in the 70s. It's really... Uh, I have friends who are animation buffs, and they swear by this film. So I, I'm really glad to add a Twitter follower of mine who uh, paid me to review the film. So, yeah, this has been a great review. This is another giant reviews in the can. More to come. I will have either the Envy Desire or the Fantastic Planet review out next week. And I will do something special for the patrons. And probably next week I will find time to record another uh, podcast, a content-minded podcast. So thank you all. As I say, this has been a, a, you know, a, a good endeavor. It's a, it's a good... Uh, it's a good grift pipeline. And of course, if you want me to review a book within a reasonable length, that, that will be, you know, that because that requires a lot of time and we'd have to negotiate. I am actually reviewing a book. So, as I say, God bless. Goodbye to sweet.